Hello, this is Mr. Taylor with Young, Young Engineers of Today. We'll be looking at ancient engineering concepts. Uh, two points we'll be making is uh, trebuchets and an intro into architecture. Uh, trebuchets, a trebuchet launches a projectile from a sling on a pivoting beam. Uh, basically, the catapult and trebuchet are being developed at the same time in two different continents here, as you can see. Um, the way a trebuchet works is focused on counterweight, and we'll be focusing on the 12th century version trebuchet, which is the counterweight trebuchet. All right. Um, historically, the Chinese developed it. But due to trade through the Silk Road between Islam and the Byzantine civilizations and further developed in the Western Europe, the trebuchet became what we know it as today. Um, it works using counterweight. Um, this counterweight is hoisted into the air and is held in place usually by a release system attached to an opposite end of the arm. Uh, this re this uh, trebuchet route Release system is activated using counterweight drops, swinging arm with sling attached. Furthermore, a uh, sling follows its arc, one end is released. As you can see that this pin, where one is permanently attached and the other end of the sling is not attached permanently, which allows for a second fulcrum point we'll talk about further on. question here for you. Here are some of the major factors. Counterweight mass, counterweight height, projectile mass, sling length, launch angle, wheels versus hinged counterweight. Uh, here is a simulation that allows you to experiment with some of these major factors. Here is the uh, website name. Now, how they work, three major areas. First we'll look at, it is powered by gravity. Uh, the gravitational potential energy of an object can be found by multiplying the weight of the object by how high it is off the ground. We looked at this uh, weeks ago at the topic of catapults, and we dug into this a little bit. Now, um, furthermore, energy is stored by determining the weight of the counterweight and the height of the counterweight. Okay. Our next topic, after we reviewed those topics, uh, generally it's force is equal to four to six times of the counterweight arm's length. Okay. Energy. Gravitational energy stored by hoisted counterweight is translated into rational kinetic energy of the sling on the arm. All right, the rational kinetic energy is dependent on the length of the arm and the weight of the counterweight. This is because of torque or rotation around a fulcrum. Now, uh, rotational kinetic energy, what I want you to focus on here is the fulcrum distance um, between the counterweight and the fulcrum point. Right. Um, in the last point, the sling acts as a secondary fulcrum. As you can see, there is uh, the sling releases and payload is launched. This is the second fulcrum, all right? At this point, the ring connected to the sling slips off and the projectile is launched. Okay, here we can get the second fulcrum. All right, this video will be posted on Edmodo. And our last point about trebuchets is this virtual simulator. What's great about it, it has all these um, performance specs that you can use right here, and you can change and alter. Well, the other thing that's great about this, if you, on this site, 
as you can see the link below, virtualtrubuchet.com. Uh, there's documentation where it gives you all the science behind it, uh, user projects and contact, where you can actually develop your own trebuchet and simulate it here, where if you built one on your own. Okay. So we're going to pause here and bring up the second um, topic of th this evening, which is architecture. All right, now we are on to ancient engineering with a focus on architecture. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, the professional architect is not a modern concept. This has been around for a very long time, ladies and gentlemen. And when you break the word down, as you can see here from Greek, you get chief and carpenter, all right? Which pretty much sums it up. Here's a nice quote for you, as you can read. That talks about um, being qualified to design and produce uh, advice as well as aesthetic and technical uh, abilities that are used when developing any form of architecture. All right. The role of an architect. Architecture is a profession that mixes art and science. The main tenets of architecture can be better understood by looking at its evolution throughout history. Now, here we're going to look at a brief history of architecture. Prehistoric, let's begin. Uh, architects exist in, in their most basic forms. We're looking at obelisks, huts, mounds, megaliths, all right? Their constructions quite often puzzle modern just to this day. So we don't know exactly what they were doing with these. Okay. One of the most earliest evidence of this is Stonehenge. Here are some more images of Earth Mounds, Israel, which then leads us to ancient Egypt. Architects were employed by rulers to build tombs and great temples. The major uh, material being used at this time was granite and limestone. Um, one of the earliest Egyptian architecture forms is the Step Pyramid. There's some more examples of Egyptian architecture. And then, which leads us to Classical. Okay. Classical spans the period from the emergence of ancient Greece, the fall of the Roman Empire. Architects began to use mathematical principles to design structures as documented um, by Roman architects. These principles, also known as classical order, still play an influence in design to this day. In addition to being places uh, to worship, temples were symbols of society and culture. They were built on the highest ground, surrounded by public meeting places and other gathering places like gymnasiums, stadiums, and theaters. Greek architecture was ruled by a strict system of uh, proportions that related to structures, individual components, the whole building. So you're looking not just at one component, but the overall structure. And these three distinct styles are Doric, Ionic, and Corinthian. All right. Each of the orders has its own style or details found in the moldings and ornamentation of the columns. It's important to remember the orders were based on the size and overall proportion system of the structure and its components. Remember, think about the overall structure, not just one individual piece. Our first style is Doric, the oldest and simplest of the Greek orders, dates back to the 7th century BC. Uh, best way to look at this is the capital or the top of the column is very plain. So you can see right here. Excuse me. Now, the uh, second style is Ionic. While Doric was considered stock Ionic, was compared to the delicate female form used for smaller buildings and interiors. So, interiors meaning inside the building. The two squirrels in its capital make it very recognizable. You see the squirrels on the top of this capital here. Corinthian. 
uh, while embedded by Greek sculpture Callimachus. This form, named after the city of Corinthian, wasn't used much by the Greeks, used more by the Romans. This column is easy to recognize due to its ornate capital. See how fancy it is. The fanciness, if you will, is increased with each level. Basically, you can still see the influence of the classical orders in modern architecture. For example, Dort can be seen in the Abraham Lincoln Memorial. Ionic can be seen uh, in the Jefferson Memorial. And the Corinthian uh, can be seen in the New York Stock Exchange. Parthenon. Uh, located in Athens on the hill known as the Acropolis, which translates roughly as the High City. For Athena, daughter of Zeus and Metis, goddess of wisdom and military victor and patron of the city of Athens, Athena was born from the forehead of Skull, the skull of Zeus. Uh, the thing I want to point out here, well, it's construction years. It only took eight or nine years. It's very impressive here. All right, it had uh, two back-to-back -back halls, as you can see here. I'll give you a moment to look over this. All right, and this que these questions here, let's answer these for you. Uh, door columns were simple and stocky. Think about this outside structure versus the inside structure, the ionic used for smaller abilities interiors. Um, Dort, an ionic. Foundation made of limestone, columns made out of marble. Uh, prior to the 5th century, Dort temple construction was made with wood. The Athenians wanted a more durable temple. Their wealth and large population of citizens and slaves made the all stone Parthenon possible. Construction method was post and lintel. Parthenon is a post and lintel construction block and block without mortar. Today we have overcome this by using the closest thing that's similar would be a beam and pillar concept, but they're attached. Where this is just sitting on top of it and using gravity and its mass weight. There are some more images of this. Um, it used over 20,000 tons of marble and a wide amount of simple machines to make this happen. Um, here are the tools the quarrymen and stonemasons used were iron and wooden tools. Okay. Uh, one of the first steps here is splitting the block from the parent rock. I'll let you read that. Next is fashioning the column capital, and this was partially done at the quarry site and then completed later on at the Acropolis. So you can read below. Um, simple machines were used for hoisting the block of the quarry entrance to move it on out of there, and I'll let you read that. Um, and then it was a qu quite the feat for loading the capital onto the wagon. I'll let you read this. And then once it was there, uh, pulling the marble up the final ramp was very impressive. Um, once it traveled 11 miles from the quarry, um, it used mules and simple machines to move this 13 ton stone um, up the hill. Okay, at the work site of the old Parthenon, and I'll let you read that. Now, um, we will start there and continue further with our next class. Well, thank you and have a great evening.